expecting changes in sunlight there to changes in temperatures here. And then they reinforce each other. So I can, this is just what the circulation looks like. Uh, it shows you the depth of a particle over 20 years. And here's that. This is the colors are the depth of the particle. The, the main point here is the, the wind of ocean circulation, the western boundary currents and so on. Everybody knows of the Stommel solution, and emphasizing why it's the west and so forth. Uh, then the whole thing about ventilated thermocline is to give it a third dimension. It's not just that. It's also down and up. So the water that at the surface here sinks, some of it ends up at the equator, comes back up, gets warm, flow north. So for detail, the next one. So I will claim th the period three to one million years. I can explain that. I haven't invoked glaciers. And I will claim that this cloud-covered tropical surface areas are actually the counterpart of polar glaciers. And that the white clouds, so if you go to Galapagos, if you go off Los Angeles, there are stratus clouds over the cold water. That's where the ocean gains heat, but the clouds actually interfere and prevent the ocean gaining as much heat as it would. So the thermocline has to rise even further so that it can gain more heat, and you get a feedback. And so you can ask that these tropical cloud-covered cold waters are the equivalent of tropical glaciers. They behave the same way. So I can explain a lot. I haven't explained yet. I said the glaciers after a while break up. Is there a counterpart? Is there a threshold for the tropical glaciers? And yes, you have to add salt. Take that into account. And so the thing about salt in this picture is that the water would sink here. Why is this so cold? It's because cold salty water sinks there. However, if you go back a picture, the density of water is this. The density gradient will be this. And salt and temperature work in opposite directions. Uh, temperature makes water less dense, this more dense. It rains a lot. If these equal, we're in trouble. The next picture, we're in trouble because it would then say the density here is the same as there, is the same as here, and the whole system will be unstable. Okay, so that will be a, a amount of a threshold. So the astonishing thing is some results from a simple model in which I can induce El Nino by just freshening the ocean. So I start out the standard case, isotherm slope looking down. I add some fresh water. I add a lot of fresh water and it crashes. And it's simply what the fresh water does is prevent the sinking. If I go back a few, another one, another one. If I go back to this, if I, the water sinks here. So everybody knows about the thermal haline sinking in the North Atlantic. This is entirely similar, but it's for the wind-driven circulation. The wind-driven circulation also involves meridional overturning. It also depends on the salinity. And you can shut it down the same way you can the thermal haline, except that it affects the Pacific, which is much bigger. It affects sea surface temperatures, and it can have a big impact on climate. So, in the next picture, uh, jump again. The, the short of it is, I think the next one also. I, I can make this statement, which you may find shocking. Uh, so I claim that the glaciers are just part of the story. And what connects these two things is the exchange of a vast amount of fresh water. So how did I get the ocean so saline that when I pour fresh water on it, it goes unstable? It's, it's a complicated sentence. I shut down this meridian overturning circulation. I have to get the water. If I get the ocean very saline, which is what happens at the end of a glaciation period, there's so much fresh water now sitting in glaciers. The ocean salinity must have been enormous. Most of that salinity... But the highest salinity must have been at the surface because the glaciers came entirely from evaporation. So we, we have no idea what the salinity field was. Uh, so the stage was set at that stage, very saline ocean. If I now start pouring fresh water on it, I will completely destroy this overturning circulation. I will shut it off and I will induce El Nino. Okay. 
So this is my candidate for the sawtooth in the temperature field. Okay. So the end. Is, so I've added one more. So we, we have numbers of studies for glaciers. I've added one more component. I think the tropical Pacific it can play the same role. Uh, I haven't said anything about the Southern Ocean and the CO2. So you can, uh, I want to convey that the phenomenon is actually quite complicated, far more complicated than we think. We can study the local components. I've just added one more, the Pacific. I've said, I haven't said anything about the Atlantic, which is quite different because it's much smaller than the Pacific. I haven't said anything about the Southern Ocean. But the key, uh, but I think, I, I hope that I've dislodged the notion that glaciers are these isolated phenomena sitting in a high latitude responding to local sunlight and then affecting the rest of the globe. And I would submit that's not the way it works. That is much more like the seasonal cycle. The Milankovitch forcing is everywhere. It induces different phenomena in different regions. They're all interacting in a way that's very complicated, that it's going to take a while to figure out. Uh, that the key question now is the next one. So these are the areas I was talking about, <coughs> well, like, say, tropical glaciers. That sea surface temperature, wherever the water is cold, you have these stratus clouds. And I would submit under glacial conditions, these expanded enormously westward. And under very warm conditions, they will contract back. And as I said, I call these glaciers because they're covered with white clouds. And they happen to do so in a latitude where sunlight is very intense. Right, so uh, the problem with glaciers is in a very high latitude. You don't have get much of an albedo effect out of that, but you can in this case. Okay, so in conclusion, how do we test this? How do I know I'm right or wrong? And I would claim there are two types of tests. The one, there are these three signals, and the one signal I claim is trends that end in thresholds. So if something, a threshold is something to avoid. So why do we have these debates about the last glacial maximum? Was it El Nino or La Nina? It, it's the worst time to focus on. It was a threshold with rapid changes from one state to another. What you should instead do is contrast preceding conditions with subsequent. So the other threshold I mentioned was the Pliocene three million years ago. So at the moment, there are big debates. I showed plots, and I said up to 3 million years ago, there was no cold water at the equator. Before that, there was. And the, this has generated big debates, in part because none of the big climate models can reproduce a permanent, what I call a permanent El Nino. Right, so I claim up to the Pliocene, up to 3 million years ago, the thermocline was very deep. Its vertical movements did not affect the SST. Sea surface temperature, you couldn't have a the interannual El Nino, so you need another name. That's why I introduced the names El Viejo, La Vieja. There are various modes of operating. So the response to the Pliocene, so at the moment if you go to the literature, there's complete disagreement of what happened during the Pliocene. And there exists a committee that has to settle. So there are many committees. One committee is the Pliocene Committee, and they have meetings once a year. And they're very constructive, but they, uh, I have to choose my words carefully. Uh, I don't think you can settle Pliocene debates or debates about the last glacial maximum by confining your attention to the Pliocene and to the last glacial maximum. So in this case, it's fairly obvious. I would argue the Pliocene, that Pliocene was a threshold. So uh, at that threshold, glaciers appear and cold water appear at the equator. So the consequences, if that hypothesis is right, is that you have obligatory oscillations subsequent, but not preceding. You have a strong trend subsequent, but not preceding. And then it's like um, the dog that didn't bark. Precession didn't change the response to precession. And it simply responded to precession is such a rapid forcing one year uh, the ocean circulation cannot adjust. So you can't expect this obligatory signal time in talking about. Glaciers are even slower than the ocean. 
A glacier cannot adjust to precession signals. So one part, and so if you go back to the last glacial maximum, it actually shouldn't be a debate. The, the debate is about use, really, of wrong terminology. You shouldn't be looking for your linear la linear. You should be looking for your vieja la vieja. So I would claim that preceding 20,000 years ago, sea surface temperature gradients were sharp, the early circulation was intense, the warmer circulation was intense. Then they all collapsed. And sea surface temperatures from 10 to 20 to 10,000 years ago decreased rapidly. Then 10,000 years ago, we went back again. And you, you can check in the data. The data has lots of uncertainty, but at least you can now look for patterns. The other thing to notice for the modelers to get, improve their models, under what we now ask the condition, the models cannot simulate a permanent El Nino at the moment. And it's an interesting story. When the models were first developed in the 60s, 70s, they suffered something called climate drift. They got the clouds wrong, and they ended up simulating a climate warmer than today. Right, that was called climate drift. They then fixed the problem some other how, and today the models get the climate of today reasonably accurate. So they did it by tuning. However, they've done it so well that if you now try to simulate a climate that's warmer than today, they actually end up with a climate that's too cold. So when you try to simulate the Pliocene, they end up with cold water at the equator. So the models have been tuned to get the climate of today right to such a degree that we should be suspicious, can we get some other climate right? And so the interesting result is you can, in these models, uh, reproduce permanent El Nino, the Pliocene, by changing the stratus clouds in high latitudes. So what you in effect do is you change the heat loss in high latitudes, therefore you change the necessary heat gain in the tropics. If the heat loss in high latitudes is decreased, the heat gain decreases, which means the thermocline must be deeper. So somebody at lunch said that one of the biggest problems in oceanography is clouds. <laughs> this is sort of a demonstration that if you want a model to reproduce a climate where there is no cold water at the equator, it's, the problem is not your ocean. The problem is the clouds in the atmosphere. And it's not the local clouds. It, it becomes complicated. So I would submit there's been progress. And then just quickly... The other approach then is to develop comprehensive climate models. It's the clouds and matter. And what we can do is then precession. So I said nothing about precession. And I'll just conclude. So what precession is, you're closer to the sun in a certain time of the year, you're further another time. So today we have an odd state. We're going into the details. The warmest water is north of the equator cold water south, the winds converge, those winds cause it to be cold. So I want to emphasize this is a very stable state of affairs. Right? The winds are reinforcing sea surface temperatures which maintain the winds. So suppose we, this is stable, suppose we superimpose a seasonal cycle, we move the sun back and forth, then it turns out to be it's a competition now between this stable state. You warm this up, will the sunlight defeat this or lose. Okay, so it turns out you have to wait until southern summer. So today it's warm here, ITCC moves to the equator in January, February, during the southern summer. Okay, so if you change your precession, you actually change when you're closest to the sun. And you, so there are two reasons for the seasons. The one is the tilt of the Earth's axis, the other one is the tilt of the orbit. Today they reinforce each other for the benefit of the southern hemisphere, but they can reinforce each other for the benefit of the northern hemisphere also. And the short of it is, we even have a test where do the other issues come in, where this, I didn't say anything here about obligatory or precession, or obligatory or sawtooth. They affect the depth of the thermocline. And as we know from El Nino, when the thermocline goes down, IDC moves to the equator. Okay. So the other two, all three interact. So th this is really sawtooth and obliquity. This is precession. 
Uh, I think it's the last picture. Uh, just a quick, so, so I think the, my strategy for establishing if these hypotheses are right or wrong is to focus on precession. And this is just how complicated precession spatial structure is. So very strong precession signal over here, a very sporadic one here. Uh, turns out to be quite energetic here. It's absent in some other places. Uh, what amazed me most is this record from China and this record of global ice volume. These Chinese, this location in southern China, did not know that glaciers were waxing and waning. It's quite an astonishing record. The, it, it tells you, it sort of defeats the Milankovitch statement that the or it's a common belief that the glaciers affect conditions the rest of the globe. They did not affect China significantly, clear demonstration. The, which You get a high correlation between these two, but it's not as if this caused this. I would argue those two were actually interacting. But anyway, I think that's the last one. So my thesis is that we A, need to adopt a reductionist approach by just focusing on three signals. There are really three ice age cycles going on simultaneously. One is due to obliquity, one is the sawtooth due to trends, and the third one is the precession can induce. I can elaborate on that if you like. And we have to throw out all the other because they're making the picture too complicated. The younger Darius, the Heinrich, Oscar. All of those things are very difficult problems, They're probably too difficult to attempt at this stage. That we're much more likely to make progress if we focus on these. However, when we test that, we have to adopt a holistic method. You cannot test, you cannot improve the model by just confining attention to the last glacial maximum or any particular time. You have to test, if you go back to the previous picture, this is of the spatial, you can see the spatial structure of obliquity will change with time, right? Uh, at any given, so that's the time record. So if I want to make a simulation of you know, that time 10,000 years ago, uh, I can come up with amplitude for what precession was here, was there, and so forth. That's a very stringent test for my model. I can then go back to the Pliocene and do it again. I just I have to go back to the kind of thing the weather forecasters do. They get tests every day. And it's only through having a lot. We, we cannot develop models without measurements. And the abundance of measurements come from the continual changes in time of having three signals superimposed. Right? We know from just superimposing two signals, the M2 and the S2 tide, you can have all sorts of variability in time. And we can explain that beautifully as the sum of two signals. The sum of three gives you even more complications, more, more complicated. So we can counter the lack of data by looking at different times and how these three were superimposed. <laughs> we can counter the uncertainty in the data by dealing with climatologies. And we didn't have time to go into it, but if you, maybe we should just go back to that very long picture. The long time series one. This one. Uh, no, no, earlier. Uh, this one, that, that one. Uh, what you'll notice is there are occasions, for example, people have commented this interglacial year doesn't seem to have ended. Whereas the interglacial over here was very abrupt. The one there is abrupt. Some along, if you go back, there was one around 600k that was extremely prolonged. Why are some long, some short? And you can actually argue that today eccentricity, for example, is very small. So the effect of precession is secondary. There are other times when eccentricity is quite big. So 200,000 years ago, eccentricity was very large. And that, that was a factor. But anyway, the, the beauty of this approach is you can have lots of tests. The records 
they have two endearing properties. A, they look relatively simple, but within the simplicity, there is actually quite a lot of variety, complexity, that can offer us tests for this. So the, the bottom line is I, I think what will happen in the field is a little bit what happened in weather prediction after the 1950s. It, it took a while, but for a while people asked completely reductionist questions that were not necessarily related to observable things. They asked what is the simplest condition under which you could have weather. And it turns out you need a rotation and you need an equator to pole gradient. So they developed laboratory experiments, uh, donut-shaped apparatus, fill it with water. And all you have to do to get weather is put it on a rotating table, put ice in the middle and make the outside warm. And now you've introduced the two key elements. You've introduced a gradient and you've introduced rotation. But that approach of absent so far in studies of paleoclimate, so very idealized situations that may not be relevant directly, but are building blocks. So I'd like to know a world in which suppose that even the axis of rotation was fixed, uh, the tilt of the axis was fixed. Could you have ice ages in such a case? If you made the orbit the circle, I doubt you'd have any ice ages. Uh, on the other hand, the moment you made the orbit the ellipse, there would be occasions. So we need to build up, we need to establish building blocks that we can use to test. So I, I would claim sort of the main thing that like you to remember from here, that looking at this from a reductionist point of view, there could be just three ice age, three ice age cycles, independent of each other, each possible in a world on its own. And in our particular world, they happen to be superimposed. Uh, they interact with each other. They have very inconvenient properties. The period of the one is 20,000, the other is 40, so they're multiples of each other. So it's not easy to use Fourier analysis. The third one is a sort to that projects onto all sorts of other frequencies. It's not, there are some mathematical techniques I think that could be used. But it's probably a period as exciting as weather forecasting was in the 50s and 60s but uh, or your linear studies in the 70s and 80s was an exciting period. And in both cases, the people who made the most progress was the youth. You have to come, people who know too much are not going to make progress on this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually an advantage not to know too much. And then so I'm, I'm so glad there's so many young people. This, I feel this is a wide open field that has not been explored, it's not been looked at in a way that could yield results. And 